Good. Good morning, everyone. If you are watching us on Facebook Live, this is the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. And if you are listening to us on the radio, good afternoon. It's now Friday. <laughs> I love how we can time jump in this show. I am your host, Olga Peters, and as always, this is the show where we discuss how things in Montpelier shake out for the rest of us. Hello, Emily Kornheiser, regular contributor. How are you today? I am well. Nice to see you this morning, Olga. It's good to see you too. And welcome back to the show, Abby Course, who is a farmer from the Whitingham area with the Course Farm Dairy. Um, but it today is talking to us as an appointed member of the Vermont Climate Council and co-chair of the Agriculture and Ecosystems Subcommittee. Did I get all that? You did. Good morning. <laughs> That's a lot of titles. Thrilled, thrilled to be back with both of you. <laughs> well, right so glad before, you could be here. Sorry. What's that, Emily? I was just saying that right before we went live, Abby was blaming me for being on the Climate <laughs> Council. And I was reminding her how important she thought it was to have a farmer be on the council and how much she wanted that to be her self as a farmer on the climate council. And so I'm looking forward to hearing all about what it means to be a farmer on the climate council and all of the things that you have been able to communicate and perhaps had communicated upon you throughout this process. Well, Do you like how neatly she did that, Abby, to remind well, you that? She's <laughs> very, very cle a clever, clever wordsmith. Um, one, I blame you because you were the, I had no idea this was even a thing. Oh. And you told me that we were talking about something I can't remember. And you said, oh, you should apply to be the representative for Farm and Forest. And then I also... Um, I think it was Erica Campbell from Bernie's office who had sent out an email to a number of farmers, you know, making us aware of this and, and her feeling that it would be of benefit to have a farmer, working farmer on the council. And I didn't making it seem like I thought it should be me as the farmer <laughs> is very problematic on my behalf. I really don't love that framing. That sounds so full of myself, but well, it was the reason that I wanted you to be on the climate council, which I think is relevant for our listeners um, and why I think you are, were such, are and were such a great choice. And I think maybe this is something you know about yourself too. Um, is that you are able, because you are from um, a very old family farm mm -hmm. that has passed through generations and you very much understand and communicate with um, and relate to some newer farmers in the area, you understand sort of what the next generation of some of Vermont agriculture looks like and could be. You're very conscious of what it means to have, um, be living on stolen land, I think is, you know, I've heard mm -hmm. you say that specifically. Um, and so being able to sort of boundary span is what we say in the sociology um, is really a tremendous asset when serving as a farmer representative in any of these difficult yeah. conversations. I, I agree with with Emily, Abby, and um, I, I also appreciate, I was so glad to see that you were on the, the council because I think, uh, as Emily said, you're really good at pulling all these strings together. But what is so crucial is we were talking before we started recording how it seems at least in Vermont that the conversation around climate change, you know, folks will say, yeah, t uh, most of our, our how Vermont contributes to climate change is transportation. And that's out there, but then like most of the conversation turns to farmers and how agriculture is creating climate change. And while it is a factor, I don't know that it is, it deserves some of the focus that it gets as far as, as the cause. Um, and so I think just think it's really great that that you're there. And 
um, I'm going to switch uh, course a little bit here. And I want to actually start with Emily. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to have a pun there, but that was pretty good. good. I like that. Um, <laughs> Emily, just bring never folks up to see four. <laughs> never. <laughs> You've never heard that one. <laughs> um, Emily, bring us up to speed because it's been a while since we talked about the Global Warming Solutions Act and some of the work that the subcommittees are doing. Um, and today we're going to be touching on some reports that came out on the 26th um, from the subcommittees. But let's take a pulse and bring listeners up to speed. Sure, and then I think Abby's going to bring, bring us further up to speed than I can. But um, so going into the way back machine, um, mm -hmm. we all know that we need to do something about global warming and climate in Vermont, um, both in terms of preventing further catastrophe. Um, you know, having Vermont do its small part having Vermont be sort of a leader among states and teaching other states how they might be able to do it. We've got some good Vermont exceptionalism going on there, but it's true. As a small state, we can often pilot things. Mm -hmm. um, and then also thinking about resiliency in the face of climate change. So all of the recent flooding in my own neighborhood that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and then the flooding in um, Putney, Dummerston, Westminster this last week and across the valley too, I believe, right, Abby? Um, yes. So across Southern Vermont, really also thinking about what are we gonna do as a state in the face of changing climate? So there's both the prevention and the actual reality. We have in statute for quite a while, we've had this mandate that we need to um, reduce our emissions and have you know, primarily green energy by 2030. Um, but we never really figured out how we were gonna actually do that. And so the Global Warming Solutions Act passed last biennium. So that was 2020. Yep. Yes. And um, passed in 2020 and set out in statute a system for us to actually make a plan. So it was, um, despite much controversy, controversy, a plan to make a plan. That was the cutting edge legislation we had. And it's important, I'm being silly about it, but it is actually important to make a good plan. Mm -hmm. And well, especially when you have to go through so many system changes to, to get to the goals. Absolutely, and work across so many sectors. And so the Global Warming Solutions Act set up a climate council made up of statutorily designated representatives, someone from the farm sector being one of them, um, to figure out what this plan should look like, bring that plan back to the legislature so that we could then enact the plan into statute and we can all um, perhaps have a better future for ourselves and our children. And um, there was, there's one sort of accountability piece in that that sort of streamlines the remedy that citizens have if the state does not act on climate. Mm -hmm. um, and basically sets up a system. So if the state is not acting on its climate goals, um, citizen groups can sue the state in a very specific way. Vermonters are welcome to sue the state at any point, any time. That's why we have, that's what the Brigham decision was for Act 60. That's, there's lots of ways that citizens sue the state in order to make sure the state's doing its job, but it set up a very specific mechanism for doing that in order to ensure accountability. So. And then the Climate Council has been meeting for the last year, delightfully through Zoom, thank you pandemic, and probably makes Abby's life a little bit easier. She doesn't have to trek up to the Northern regions. And- Yeah, because Whitingham is on the mass border. So like, that's a trek. Two hours and, two hours and 20 minutes. To not In good weather. With In no construction, weather. there's a lot of highway construction. Lately. With so, no construction, correct. Yes. So anyway, so they've been doing their work and they divide up into subgroups and the subgroups have been making recommendations and sort of the sub reports are all being released right now and will all be assembled into a final report that's gonna be released in November, I think, soon. November. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what I have, background. <laughs> um, shifting over to, to you, Abby, 
there were I went through the the sub your subcommittee's report last night the agriculture and ecosystems subcommittee and um what a lot of things oh yeah did I, I say just, something wrong so first I do want to make it very very clear that everything coming out of the climate council at this point isn't isn't is entirely draft mm, there is no you. this is not a report this is not anything that is remotely it represents a lot of work and in the agriculture and ecosystem subcommittee a lot of i think really important process behind the scenes to get to what we offered which i can talk more about later but um it is this is we are about to go through a public engagement process mm -hmm. um regarding this what we've put out it's we felt like the general thinking is that it's difficult for the public to just respond cold to some you know the broad like we're facing climate change what do you think we should do is a little tricky to get your mind around particularly as you said earlier Olga about the number of sectors through which mm -hmm. this has to transform and so this is to try to give the public something a little bit concrete to respond to, but to keep it extremely high level, which we have received some criticism around. I think people are like, this feels like platitudes, this, you know, that's the intention that was deliberate to keep it at that level, to allow for a co-created portion after within the public engagement process to try to have the actions that come under these broader strategies be co-created with the public mm -hmm. to reflect as we I'm sure we'll talk more about to attempt the tenets of a just transition. Well that's one of the the things I was going to say that I liked about this piece was that it did go into how did we get here and what were some of the what were some of the goals we were looking at that we want to that were kind of guiding us and i thought that was actually really good because like you said climate change is a, is a big thing to get your head around um, and so often and emily i think emily and i talked about this in a previous episode about so often we look at climate change as what individuals can do um, like buy a bicycle rather than drive to work or something like that. But what these um, action plans or drafts or strategies are talking about is more of those system-wide sector changes. Um, and so I would love if we could start with, um, because it seems to be cornerstone, two things that stood out to me were kind of cornerstone, were just transition, but also setting up an ecosystem within this sector uh, between reducing emissions, storing and sequestering carbon and adapting and building resilience seem to be the ecosystems. Could you talk about those two things and, and how they do or do not feed into each other? Sure, let's see. So I'll take the ecosystem part first. So Emily told you about the components of the plan. The one thing, if I may offer some constructive feedback regarding the, the law. Sure. Always love constructive yes. feedback about laws that have already passed. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Who knew? I'm just kidding. We can always pass new little tweaks. I mean, well, so, and also sometimes you don't know what the feedback needs to be until the law starts playing out. Yeah, so course. much, so much. And we should actually spend more time going back and fixing what we've already done than creating new things sometimes. So fire away, uh, Abby. I was just amusing myself. I, it's, it's fine. I, it's, we're good. So <laughs> the, the trickiness of what was set forward, and I don't, I can understand both sides of this, right? I, I understand why the law was written the way that it was written. I understand the governor's concerns and why he vetoed in all fairness, because what has happened with the work of the council is we have been trying to learn from some of the other states that have been engaged in this work. And we are starting the process multiple years later and on a much tighter deadline 
than mm. any other Northeastern states around us. Mm. So the problems that that has set up as I see it is that you, it is nearly impossible to shepherd forth a just transition when you need to be moving at the speed of trust with communities of color and people who have been historically disadvantaged or disinvested and meet these very strict mitigation targets for 2025. The other problem is that because the Agency of Natural Resources can be sued regarding their inability to meet those mitigation targets, it automatically puts the focus more myopically on mitigation measures regarding emissions versus the full ecosystem. Mm, so from mm. an, I'm an organic farmer, right? I think in ecosystems, I, we constantly, nah, that's not even fair. As a farmer, you're constantly thinking about the balance right of the people of the land the people and the animals and it's a you know three-legged stool right all of those components are important and when one falls everything else falls too it's the same as i see it it's the same thing with mitigation adaptation and resilience you can't have one without the other mm -hmm. if we stopped emissions tomorrow completely we would still be yes. living with the repercussions of the, sorry, my children are coughing everywhere. Um, I'm sorry, your children living, are coughing everywhere. Still be living with the, the repercussions of the de decisions we've made up to this point, and we would still need adaptation and resilience work and measures to be put in place for us to survive here. Mm -hmm. So it's all very, multi-layered and all being done on a really, really quick time. I mean, in some ways I'm so lucky, I guess, that I was injured and that the weather has made it so that I can't be in the fields because I have been putting an enormous amount of time into this, trying to keep up and stay true to the constituency that I feel I am you know, that I was appointed to represent, which requires a lot. And um, anyway, that's, so that's a little bit of where, what the, the trickiness of the things that we're dealing with, given how the law was set forth. Can we mm -hmm. define those three terms? Oh no, I knew you were gonna ask that. They're defined in, the law, which I don't have the statute in front of me. So that is something those there are there are some supporting documents on the Vermont Climate Council's website that I think do call out the actual definitions of resilience and adaptation and mitigation. I would say that an interesting perspective that was offered to to us by um, Judy Dow, who is um, an Abenaki uh, educator mm -hmm. and indigenous representative on our subcommittee. Um, so uh, somebody who has a house in a floodplain, for example, and the flood happens, their house is ruined, and they built, you know, the house is rebuilt in the same place for all kinds of very understandable reasons. So much so. You know, that is a very resilient action, right? The, the, the humans are incredibly resilient, right? They can, they can endure all kinds of things. And so needing to go through that, it requires a very resilient human to be able to go through those cycles of loss mm -hmm. over and over and over. And, and so in that active, example, would mitigation be that person whose house is sited in the floodplain and their house is destroyed there's actually emotional support, financial support, social support to perhaps move their home. 
somewhere that, that it will not be reflooded, but that they can still have access to the community that has supported them and they have supported their whole life. They will have the same level of, or a comparable level of sort of financial stability as they had in their previous home. Is that what? That I would actually call adaptation. Okay. The mm -hmm. mitigation would be policies that, <clears throat> You know, as and God, I'm, this is this is where this stuff becomes really, really difficult. But yeah, you know, mit, a mitigation policy would be that development doesn't occur in floodplains. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like like you said earlier, this is climate affects everything. Um, and that's another component of this that I think makes this really difficult from what I've witnessed throughout my life as, <laughs> as a farmer. Um, it can feel as a lay person functioning down here on the very south of Vermont as though people aren't necessarily talking to one another mm. across agencies, you know, that this thing is happening over here in education that has an impact on, you know, these sectors over here, but they're not talking to one another about what they're doing and how those things are going to intersect. And climate requires that. There is no option because you have trade-offs and co-benefits and you're, you know, one thing over here, everything in nature is connected and you pull, it's the spider, what you pull a strand, and it has an effect over here, over here. And so that's a lot of, I think what this is going to be too, is people have to start talking to one another, you know, about how these things are going to play out for the people of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Oh my mm -hmm. God. Just mm. Well, what I like about the example you just gave, um, Abby, is that, um, you know, talking about mitigation, resilience, and adaptation is, um, it, it outlined, it highlights, I think, what you were talking about too, about the need to catch up at certain places. That folks, the policy may get created that says people can't, can't work in floodplains, can't build in floodplains. However, there are already houses that are in floodplains. And, and so you can't just look at those folks who are living there and being like, okay, well, you're all illegal now. Like that's not necessarily fair either. <laughs> no, no, oh God, please. But that's no, no, what no, I no, like no. about that example is it highlights how these things do need to talk to each other um, because think, everybody's at different stages. And I think again, this is, I always use the, the composting law as an example of, <laughs> you know, we set hi. We set a law. Type in what? Um, we set a law that said we were composting. That doesn't, you know, <laughs> governance by statute. It it makes us. It, I'm gonna say it. I'm. A, I am. I'm gonna say it. It makes us feel better, right? Mm -hmm. And Vermont, it, it, Vermont exceptionalism, I feel, is really guilty in this regard. Mm -hmm. We set forward, you know, we say we're doing this and this and this, but we don't necessarily have the mechanisms to measure, the, you know, the metrics, the data component of how we're doing, how we're measuring up to the things we're setting forth. We don't necessarily have the infrastructure. We don't necessarily have the funding. We don't have, we haven't done the due diligence. And I am saying we, right? I'm not, there is no attack here. It's just observations that, um, you know, we haven't done our due diligence to how, how do we <laughs> compost as a state? What does that look like? Where does the food go? Who's trucking the food? What are the environmental repercussions of doing a lot of mass composting? What are, you know, and so it's the same in this realm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in the composting example, which I also love, because down here in Brattleboro, we, mm -hmm. before the law went into effect, we had municipal compost where someone picks up a bucket at the end of my driveway once a week. It comes more often than the garbage truck. Garbage trucks only Mm -hmm. every two weeks, compost trucks every week. And we are given special bins that are really mostly animal proof. Like Mm -hmm. we have the tools that we need as individuals to make this work. The town did a lot of work around sort of like siting and processing of the compost and a lot of education about how to do it. I don't think that's happening anywhere else in the state. And the idea that I would like somehow have to in the course of my like daily life haul some like bin o compost if from my apartment in the back of my like random yeah. sedan with my kids in the back to yeah. somewhere maybe and then dump it and then rinse it and then put it back in my car and then like what who it's has a pain as someone who nonsense? has to do that no that is a pain for that you shouldn't <laughs> that's ridiculous that is not like that is not what government is for mm-hmm. we can't just like put out mandates to feel better and then expect everyone to somehow like patch together solutions. No one has time for that. And it's totally inefficient. And Mm. I think that that goes, so in in another interesting component of, and this ties, I'm trying to tie back Olga into some of your original, the data shows very clearly that in Vermont, as in most places, right? It is the most privileged and wealthiest people who have the most impact in a climate sense Mm -hmm. and the low, the people with the least ability, capability, resourcing to lowest income that are bearing the disproportionate burdens of the impact of climate change, namely Mm -hmm. communities of color and low income Vermonters. So we're all Vermonters as well. So yeah. There's that too, which ties in, I think, what you're saying, Olga, earlier about, you know, there's this whole narrative around transportation, you know, transportation is our largest emission sector, as is our our buildings, is another component of that. And yet we hear a lot about agriculture, Mm -hmm. um, which as the Just Transitions subcommittee set it forth in their guiding principles, outdoor workers, farmers, et cetera, are frontline communities. They are impacted communities in the face of climate change. They bear the, a large part of the burden of the fallout of climate change, which I can definitively attest to since we have not been on our hay fields in over a month. Because it's too wet, it's too rainy. Because it's too wet. It went from being too dry to being more saturated than is remotely feasible to drive a tractor on without destroying the land base. Yes. Um, I love when you're on the show, Abby, because we can talk and talk and talk. And I love how this conversation started with climate change and yet actually kind of turned to a systems conversation um unfortunately we have to break so we can hear from some of our underwriters um but before we do is there any just last concepts that you want to leave listeners with before we head to break abby the main concept i would it's just we are headed into public comment time public engagement time so if you have thoughts particularly if you are from communities of color around Vermont or coming from low income areas or areas that rural Vermonters, we need to hear from you about what your fears are, what your concerns are, what do you think could be helpful policies that would help you adapt and remain resilient in the face of climate change. Abby, thank you. The Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return in a moment. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser, and 
farmer and uh, co-chair of the um, Agriculture and Ecosystem Subcommittee for the Vermont Climate Council, Abby Course. So glad you're back with us. Hey, Emily, what do we need to remind folks? We would like to remind folks that the views and opinions expressed on the Montpelier Hour, Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests and not the radio station or the TV station. They are not the views and opinions of the entire legislature or the whole Democratic or Progressive Caucus. They are not the views and opinions of the whole Climate Council or every farmer in Vermont or every parent or everyone who lives in Whitingham. They are just of the three individual people in this conversation. Thank you. So uh, we touched on this in the first half, but I wanna circle back to it. I, I do wanna get two recommendations that have come out in some of these plans um, so far. But before we do, we mentioned the term just transition a few times. And I know this is a little tricky, uh, but I think it's a really important nugget that we, we should bite into here. And either Emily or Abby, whoever wants to start, talk to us about just like what a just transition is and why it's important with climate change. Well, I, I have to say, just sort of like we did with the law itself, it's interesting for me to hear from Emily as a lawmaker a and a policymaker, what was the intention going in, you know, into how the law was crafted mm. and what the discussions or the thinking were regarding the just transition piece um, yeah. of, the, of the legislation. So, mm -hmm. um, I think we all, I'm going to get really philosophical for a minute. We, um, and a dear friend of mine says this often, but we all sort of organize around the area of sort of like greatest and immediate existential threat to ourselves. So, you know, when you're poor, you're putting most of your energy into getting through. Um, when you're a woman, you often put most of your energy into dealing with patriarchy when you're black, you put most of your energy into, you know, dealing with white supremacy. Um, when you're a farmer, you put most of your energy into fighting with like the weather and the government. So what? <laughs> and woodchucks. What? And woodchucks. So, <laughs> and woodchucks. Um, and what that means is that the sort of people who are left to really face the climate emergency as their greatest threat or most immediate threat is often wealthier white Vermonters. And I'm so grateful to those folks that like they don't have all of these other emergencies that pull them away from this emergency because it's a huge emergency. But um, it means that often our policies or our thinking on that are very much from a particular lens. And so a lot of some legislative work and a lot of sort of national solutions and conversations around a just transition is that like everyone gets a solar panel, everyone gets a heat pump, everyone buys a hybrid or an electric car and they're very market-based solutions. And those very market-based solutions occasionally acknowledge that like we need some sort of incentive beyond the goodness of people's heart. And so we add like a rebate to the market-based solution, but like, who can afford the upfront money to get the rebate later? And also the market does not solve all the problems. So when I think about a just transition, I think about the, when I first joined the climate caucus and um, sort of led the group through establishing a set of guiding principles for all of the legislation that we would endorse or get behind as a legislative climate council. And that a huge part of that was this idea of the just transition and that whatever we do is going to center, acknowledge, accommodate, meet the needs of poor people and people of color. Um, and so for me, that's what a just transition is. It's acknowledging that like we need to start by meeting the financial, cultural, racial resource needs of that population as we're creating any mitigation resiliency action plan of any kind. So, you know, just having the community actions going around spraying insulation in everyone's houses, like 
one, it's not enough. And two, they're just not well-resourced enough to do it. And like, that seems to be one of the only right now, one of the only policy solutions we have to meet the needs of low-income Vermonters. So that's for me what a just transition looks like and why um, I think it is woven into this. Mm -hmm. So Abby, is that playing out differently for your subcommittee as you're actually digging into this issue and coming, trying to come up with pathways? Can I add one more thing mm -hmm. on the just transition that I forget about because I'm from Brattleboro? Um, the other thing is there's some real fear in Vermont um, that any sort of climate resiliency just transition action um, is any climate plan is going to basically like ask everyone to move from the rural hinterlands and live in like densely populated urban centers. I don't think there's like any universe where that would actually happen or be the recommendation, but that's a real fear for people. Like powerful, like even some of my constituents in West Brattleboro have a real fear about that. And so I think the just transition is also acknowledging that what we do needs to like meet the needs of rural people in a real way. That's not just like asking them to move up the mountain and down into the valley. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Abby, thank you for bearing with us through much action at your house this morning. Uh, my apologies. I don't, ah, oh, this always happens when record gets hit, like yeah. the maelstrom of, um, so that, Emily, is very helpful to hear. I have to frame whatever I say very carefully. It is, so, okay, I can speak to agriculture and ecosystems. So that's what I'll start by doing. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I tried to do within that subcommittee was to ensure that around the table, we, the metaphorical Zoom table we had created, we, I, I had done what I could to reach out to representatives of communities that historically might not have been at the table. That is how Judy came to be there. Um, I did do some outreach to the Vermont Relief Collective Network, and it was sort of decided that, well, and this is, a, this is an issue of the process, right? The process had, quote unquote, had to continue because of the deadline. Moving at the speed of trust means that we were already well into the work as I was trying to do outreach to these um, two communities who have been historically left behind in these conversations. Mm -hmm. Also, the thing I think we need to understand is that <clears throat> communities of color particularly are fed up with what is constantly being asked of them for no money, for no resources, and to a certain extent, I think have decided to go their own way mm -hmm. and create their own um, collectives, their own action, their own mutual aid, which is also an incredible thing to witness, but is just, I think a testament to how far down we've gone on this path before legitimately considering a just transition. So mm. there's that component of things, but I did try when we were thinking about how to structure this subcommittee, I wanted to bring people in who, who were working or had worked cross-disciplinary in cross-disciplinary ways, or who had been within multiple agencies or organizations, who had experienced a range of different programs or you know, the way that the government works that could bring forward not just one perspective. Because for me, what I, what I hear often from people is that the, the component of my perspective that I think stands out somewhat is the intersections that I represent, Emily, like you were talking about. I am a woman, I do not farm with my partner who is very supportive of my farming, but my husband is not a farmer, right? I am a 
I'm a mother. I'm a rural citizen. I have been most of my life. You know, there's all, I come from an old family farm, but that has made the transition to a different, you know, a new. So I wanted to try to bring together more people who were like that so that we could really get into the meat of these issues and bring forward the tensions and the conflicts and not avoid that. I think a lot of the time we avoid that because it's really hard to work through all those, but I wanted to create a process so that anything that we that came out of our subcommittee had been battered around a little bit before it came out. So, you know, an indigenous perspective on land and agriculture, right, is so different from the status quo of land and agriculture. And so what we have arrived at was, you know, months and months, We so as a subcommittee, we have, I think it's 11 members and then four or five state of Vermont staffers that support us and help with some of the more technical components. And then we split into further into task groups that, that worked on the carbon budget, forestry, nature-based solutions, um, food systems and access, and agriculture emissions. And I think that's all of them. And within each task group, without reaching a quorum, or so we didn't reach a quorum and cause trouble, we had five people there. So even the small groups that we had, had a, you know, a good amount of conversation in how they populated the suggestions that came forward. Um, and so with all that tension and like discovery and different perspectives, were you able to come to recommendations? Yeah. That's incredible. It, it is. I think, yeah, you know, whether when they come up against land, right? Land is everything. And so, you know, how much they stand as they go through the process further, I don't know. I do think that we like to use agriculture as a convenient scapegoat because it is, it's a sector that the average, like we talked about the last time, the average person is three or four generations removed from the farm. The intricacies of farming and the way that it is done and the, the massive amounts of policy and government intervention that has gone into how it's done is not something that is well understood. And so it's much easier to focus there because farmers are busy, right? They can't testify. They can't, they can't show up en masse. They can't, you know, organizing farmers is really, really difficult. So it's also really easy to target that group of people. Um, anyway, I just lost. And so what, will you tell us about the recommendations a little bit? Yes. So our recommendations, we had seven pathways that we offered. Do you want me to read them? I, I would. <laughs> What? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. So the first is maintain and expand carbon sequestration and storage in Vermont's natural and working lands, soils, and waters. Sustain, restore, and enhance the health and function of Vermont's natural and working lands, soils, and waters, which support both natural and human communities in adapting to and building resilience for climate change. Support and empower Vermont's farmers, foresters, and land workers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from their operations. Support and empower Vermont's natural and working lands owners, managers, and caretakers to enhance farm and forest viability and make informed decisions to increase resilience and adaptation to climate change. Grow and connect local sustainable natural and working lands economies, markets, and food systems and provide equitable access to them. Shape land use and development that support landscape scale, carbon sequestration and storage, climate resilience and adaptation, and natural and human communities for a sustainable and equitable future, and create accessible, <laughs> equitable research partnerships and education, promote shared understanding, and invest in the sustainable and equitable workforce development for the sectors that depend on and benefit from natural and working lands, soils, and waters. 
And then we had, you know, we have strategies underneath all of those that are some further examples, um, you know, t regarding technical assistance, funding working lands enterprise, um, further funding of Vermont conservation, um, VHCB, Housing and Conservation Board, uh, a whole number of strategies to achieve that. And then even further, we will get into actions specific to that. But if you'll notice, there's a lot of wording around support and empower because mm -hmm. this, and this is, I think a component of what I always talk about that policy is so often made in isolation of the people who have to carry it out. Mm -hmm. So when you have a farmer and a forester at the table, they can say, well, have you considered this? Like a lot of the time, the, the workforces would be willing to adapt, right? Or be willing to do things differently. They have no money. Mm -hmm. They have no educational resources. They have, and our systems don't, aren't set up to support them in making those changes. And so a part of a just transition, and I think that a lot of the time, Emily, to your part, to your point about the fear, I think a lot of the res the resistance to these discussions, the the res you know the the pushback, right, or the critiques you hear about things like this, is is based in fear. Mm -hmm. And if you can't understand why somebody is afraid, what's mm -hmm. making them afraid? Mm -hmm. Why are they, sh why are they coming forward in that way, then I don't think you have a hope of understanding how you can possibly help them move forward or move beyond that fear. It is not going to, in, in my experience, yeah. mm -hmm. it does not work to batter people down and just tell them what they need to do. It is the responsibility of the people at the top with the most wealth, with the most privileges to to get curious, to learn, to understand why people are having such a difficult time with certain things and why these changes are making them afraid, what they're afraid of, why they're afraid and how you craft policies so that those fears are not reasonable. <laughs> or they're um, answered. And and so a lot of this was about how, how do you start the transfer, the transformation of a sector to support the people within the sector and the land at the same time, right? Cause you need both to make different decisions mm -hmm. because farmers didn't invent, invent pesticides. They didn't invent over usage of antibiotics. They didn't in, like, this didn't come from farmers. And so this, the change, the transformation also needs to come from somewhere else because this is, the farmers are in these patterns for reasons beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think we all are in- I agree. Of us are in these patterns for yes. reasons beyond ourselves, yes. right? And yes. so the more we can shift the policy practice landscape to make it easier to make these choices. Because um, yes. I think we're all, the vast majority of folks in Vermont um, are making enough responsible choices every day. They're sacrificing enough, they're struggling yes. enough. Um, and so to put this all on the onus of responsibility, and if you only cared about your children enough, um, oh my God. is not, is not going to help anyone get anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, so I appreciate, not... yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, when I think about what you, you know, the, this idea of increasing technical assistance and training and workforce training and all of that, I think about how the farmers that I talk to all flag for me, regardless of climate change, not climate change, just like trying to make it as a farmer, the gutting of the agricultural extension services. Yes is a massive problem in your lives. Yes. Um, and so if we could rehabilitate the agricultural extension services as a tool mm -hmm. of taking care of climate, that's meeting someone's already existing need that's pressing in front of them. That is their area of greatest existential threat. 
and it's doing something about the climate, which might be a secondary threat, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I have said along the way, the thing that I am really concerned, so the statistic during COVID, I'm not sure where it lies now, one in three Vermonters are food insecure. Mm -hmm. That is insane in a place with as many farms as we do have, that that number of people are food insecure. And that means we are not doing something correctly. And I think that that's the other point, Emily, I could not agree more. And that's what I'm always trying to say is most, I, I could be skewed on this, but I'm not sure that your average Vermonter would say that they're thriving. I, I think there's mm -hmm. a, I think that there are an enormous number of people who are in a state of emergency already. And to your point earlier, Emily, you cannot expect people who are living in, this is psychology 101, like you cannot expect people who are living in a state of emergency or in a crisis to do anything other than survive. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. not on them to fix. And- no. And so, you know, one, so the ag extension is a really good example of sort of a mitigation, you know, um, and prevention measure that would make a real difference in people's lives immediately and have really good long-term impacts. You know, another program that we sort of introduced this year before we waited for the plan that I think is another good example of one of those really good tweaks is if your car dies, you can buy a hybrid or an electric car for sort of the same used car price that you might have bought a regular used car in. And so it creates, you know, like you're meeting someone in the crisis that they're in and offering them a solution that is good for the climate and for people and for their bottom line, because gas will be cheaper, right? Um, and so. But I would yeah. ask, I guess I would ask to that, how are you making sure that the, the, the car dealerships know about that program? How yes. I buy yes. cars in Massachusetts. I don't buy cars in Vermont. Mm -hmm. How? So again, yes. Fantastic. Yes. We do need a solution to meet the people in their moment of crisis. We also need to know where and how we're either meeting or not meeting the intention, because that's another thing that I continue to hear is, well, we have all these really good programs about blah, 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 blah. I don't doubt that we have really good programs for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. What I do doubt is that they're reaching everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And Absolutely. they're reaching the people. And, and I know I can attest to this as a person who farms on the Massachusetts border and, you know, this is, I do not have access to the same services that farmers in Addison County do. And I understand it's difficult when things are based here to make everything make its way down here. That's a simple logistics issue, it's right? It's a tiny state. It's, that's my point is it doesn't seem, I don't understand why as a farmer, in a more remote place, why it should be more difficult for us down here. Oh God, I always think of Ashley, you know, Reebok in this way. Like it just, yeah. When you're farming in a place where there aren't as many farmers, it means that your farming is potentially that much more critical. And, you know, in the case of a Reebok, for example, they are legitimately providing food to the community and they're doing SNAP and they're doing, you know, lower income access points to the best of their ability and all those different things. And so they need resourcing just as much as anybody else. And it's not necessarily making it here. Mm -hmm. And that's right now. So in a climate context, it becomes even more important. And I always feel like people have a difficult time understanding how food and climate intersect but in a just transition, part of that is not putting off our impact somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that means that to the best of our ability here, we need to feed our people primarily 
from our soils and from our agriculture and from our farms here and only bring in what is absolutely necessary. Rather than further exacerbating the problem, the other drought and the um, human exploitation and yes. poisoning of the land in And the California. emissions profile yes. from yes. bringing everything yes. somewhere yes. else. I am not advocating for all of us to immediately go back to, you know, the diet on which my father grew up. He mm -hmm. is not advocating for that either. He would be <laughs> delighted if he never ate a dandelion green ever again in his life. But, <clears throat> it, and I think that that's, we're in a moment of both and, I think again, the fear component a lot of the time is that people are just afraid of what they're going to have to give up. Mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm as much as we can frame some of this as an opportunity for a different way, that's going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You don't have to go to an entirely local, completely Vermont based diet. It's just, we should really be focusing thoughtfully on what can we produce here? Mm -hmm. And how do we make sure that what we can produce here, we are getting to our people here. Abby, thank you. That is, we are just minutes away from being out of time. And I think that's a great place to end. Um, but remind us, when does this public uh, process start? How can people access it? Where can they find information? So is that there, available yet? So you can Google the Vermont Climate Council. It will send you to um, an agency of administration website on the on Vermont's government site. Um, there is a public portal there where people can add comments through the public portal. And it is also listed there as to when the different subcommittees meet, when the full council meets. And as the public engagement rolls out, I'm certainly happy to disseminate the more details of that. I believe there will be seven different listening sessions in different parts of the state and some remotely as well. So it's, you know, this is the time where if you have thoughts and concerns, it's really important that we have people communicate those to us. Abby Course, a uh, member of the Vermont Climate Council, thank you so much for joining us today. Emily Kornheiser, where can people find you if they want more information? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and there are links to my Facebook and Instagram and um, email and phone number and announcements about upcoming events, which I will restart in September <laughs> and would love for anyone to call or write or tweet or whatever works for you, but be in touch. As always, you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour at our Facebook page, at our Captivate page, and on iTunes and BCTV and WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I want to toast to all the work Abby has done on behalf of uh, her subcommittee, and I hope your shoulder mends soon. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Cheers and thank you. Cheers.